We're up to our entire second interview with John Helliwell, the sax player for Supertramp, also the MC, but he played a lot of instruments. And in this series, we talk about the high points of Supertramp, their two lead singers, Roger Hodson, when Roger left and Rick Davies was left to be the only lead singer, when the band had to quit in 2015, all the albums and a lot more. This is Rock History Book, our entire interview with John Halliwell of Supertramp. What was Christmas like for you as a child? What, what was the atmosphere like? It was uh, my, my mom and dad singing on their own in the house excerpts from Handel's Messiah. That's basically what I remember. Hallelujah. His, Hallelujah. His name shall be called it, Prince of Peace. It was, it was good. Yeah. <laughs> And do you celebrate Christmas? Do you have any traditions that you've carried on now? Because as I get older, I'm I'm not as high on ceremony in some things and more high on ceremony in certain things. It's strange. You never know what's going to be important to you as you get older. What about you now? For well, it's, it's going to be quiet here because our family's kind of away. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll have a nice Christmas dinner. It doesn't have to be. Traditionally here, it's been turkey, like the American Thanksgiving. You do turkeys in Canada for, for your Thanksgiving. Yeah. But um, there's been a lot of, um, we, we went off it, turkeys, because we had some poor ones that were kind of watery. And and now there's bird flu and it's killing off all the, all the turkeys anyway. So we're going to have a nice piece of roast beef. This album did things to me that Supertramp did. I know there's three tracks on there, but... There is there. It reminded me there of that symphonic side of Supertramp and that sort of before the calm before the storm, because Supertramp would have these hills and valleys, of course. I'm not telling you anything. You yeah. don't know you were there. Yeah. But there is that sense. And then you 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 sort of let your hair down in a few songs. Ever leave don't, me. don't ever leave me. That one. Yeah. Good. I'm very proud of this. Um, interesting, interesting quote here right off the bat. An album full of restraint and finesse where the saxophonist and the clarinetist, clarinetist uh, demonstrate their art of making the repertoire sing My, from Jazz Mania. Wow. Well, that sounds nice. Yeah. Is that, that's a review of the latest, the latest um, CD. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I'm proud of it. And I, I was really pleased to work with these Dutchmen. Dutch Jazzmen. Well, the beginning, the impetus of it, like you were ready to rock and roll, and then, of course, this thing called COVID happened. It all, it, everything got pushed back. And I've got this other project, which I probably talked about last time, and, that, and that's my super big tramp band. Uh, and that's been held back by two different things. We'll talk about it. Let's talk about it when we, um, when we get recording. Oh, we're recording. Oh, good, 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 good. You know, the album turned 47 just a few days ago. Yeah. Crisis. But you mentioned, when we talked last time, I, I asked you about the three. Of course, you, you said uh, breakfast, uh, crime, and then you went, well, brother, where are you bound? And then you kind of went, well, I kind of want to put crisis in there as well. Um, I And everyone, it's interesting, describe Crisis, and we'll talk about the individual songs on the new album in a second, uh, The in, in as an underrated record, because when I heard uh, the first two tracks, the Rogers songs come opening that, that album, I remember going, I just got excited. I remember going, oh my God, this is really important, because, you know, pacing is very important. That album starts off amazingly. But do you look at that as being a, a, an underrated album for Supertramp? Well, they're good songs, uh, and, and I think that, it, well, it didn't suffer, but it was different from Crime, of, it came after Crime of the Century, didn't it? And Crime of the Century was kind of an integrated project, where it was kind of, not exactly concept, but it was kind of Close enough. leaning. This, and then it turned out that Crisis t just turned out to be a collection of, of songs, and we just tried to put to them together in the right order for, to, to take you on a little journey but that's basically what it was but good songs in there yeah and we had a really good time recording that we recorded that album we started it in the a m studios in in los angeles in hollywood which were originally the charlie chaplin movie studios 
and they had so they had two or three studios in there, and, that, and we used that, and we we got on well. And I used to commute from Venice Beach to the studio every day by bicycle, braving all these stupid, massive American cars which are barreling down on me on the on the roads. But it was quite quite interesting. You were thirty years old then. Yeah, long yeah. time ago. On a bike. More well, than I'm 62 and I'm on a bike, so. Yeah, I've just been on a bike um, this morning, uh, um, and I'm 78. <laughs> I, I'll say it what I said last time. You look amazing. You still look like that guy. Well, I am the same guy, but um, I don't always um, feel 30. <laughs> you included two songs from Crisis on here. Yeah, I I, I didn't think that it was crisis i just i just picked the song the, the thought of the songs yeah so there's the two of us and um why'd you pick that just a normal day you started laughing oh it just just because it was a really nice tune this this thing this album's about uh tunes beautiful tunes uh, and uh why did i take two numbers from <laughs> crisis just because there were numbers I liked. Yeah. Made a version of um, uh, the, two, the two of us. Oh, no, I didn't know if I did if everyone was listening. You know, I do if everyone was listening on the CD with the string quartet, the Ever Open Door CD. But we also do it with the Super Big Tramp Band. We do a version of it, and it's rather nice. If everyone was listening, is a nice, a nice tune too. I, I guess uh, the two Super Tramp songwriters they wrote some good tunes. It all came together because of one particular tune that I thought we we should we should do this, which is "Don't Ever Leave Me," and it, and it's a short standard tune. I first heard it by uh, Keith Jarrett, and I thought, oh, that's a lovely tune. Let's let's explore it. And you know, with a tune. You normally get a verse or two verses, and then you get a chorus and all that. So I listened to it, and the verses just don't make it at all. So in the end, there's only a chorus, and the chorus is only 16 bars long. It's really, it's really short. So uh, then I had this idea, once I knew that we were going to make a, an LP vinyl, I thought, well, maybe we should... Just, just try different versions of this tune and then we can have the tune at the beginning and the end of each side of the LP, which is going, going to be made. It's not out yet, but it, it should be out in a, a month or so. So we did four different versions, a trio, a quartet, a duo, and a solo between the, between the four of us. You know, to, uh, to, to overstate the obvious, I, I keep going back because I was always a Roger guy. I told everyone I was a Roger guy, loved those songs. But as I've gotten yeah. older, it's strange. And I don't like Roger's songs any less. But now I'm sort of on, in the Rick corner, uh, you know, just a nervous wreck. Uh, what's the song that starts? Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. From now on. From now yeah. on. Oh, that, yeah. that's, the, that's the tune that initially attracted me to the band, which I heard. On the first day, I went to uh, have a blow rehearsal. They um, had it then. They had it back in. Uh, it was July the seventeenth, nineteen seventy-three, and I went down to a studio and had a blow with them. They were rehearsing, and that's a number that I think that wow, that is a number. That is a great number. I would like to be able to play with this band. Did they have? Did Roger? Uh, did Rick have the, the beginning then? Did do 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 do? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and they had that super melody. Do da, do da, do 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 do. Yeah. Yes, it's um, it's a great number. Yeah. I haven't uh, done a solo version of that yet. <laughs> yes. Let's send it out into the ether. That's that's. I immediately after reading what you had said about uh, uh, Don't Ever Leave Me, looked up Keith Jarrett's version. Because, I mean, everyone that I knew, all the rockers I knew had the Cone concert. Everyone. Because you had to have the Cone concert, right? Um, 
Uh, and so we'd listen to it and all of a sudden you get an album, you go, oh, I'm not a rocker. I like this. That's what albums like you, the albums that you have, because you're doing songs that other, that, that like Sting, August Wind, August Winds. I knew that right away. Yeah, that's a beautiful tune too, you know. Um, people come up with, lovely, that Pat Matheny tune is uh, from this place. Yeah, his vocal, so yeah, the vocal lovely. version. So lovely. Uh, yeah, so I like good tunes. Uh, and um, so we, I think we did them with a little sensitivity with these Dutch guys. Great pianist, great drummer. Well, who's in the band? Tell us who's in the band. There's a bass player called Jasper Somson, and I met him when I was talking to uh, Challenge Records in Amsterdam about three years ago. I was talking about the release of Ever Open Door, that, al that album that they did. They, they released it for me. Um, and I met him there, and, and we said, the head of Challenge Records said, you guys should make an album. And we said, yeah, why not? Because <laughs> I listened to what Jasper had done, and it, it really pleased me. Uh, and um, and then he knew what I'd done and listened to the recordings. So we decided to make a record, but that got put back for a couple of years. We we didn't make this record until uh, this year, March this year. And uh, yeah, so we just decided to do it. And he ch Jasper suggested the pianist Hans Rumens and the drummer, Marcel Cerise. And um, it, it, we just got together in the studio and rehearsed for a day or two and then recorded for a day or two. And that was it. Gelled, it all gelled, it was nice. I would do it again. And you sh I'm sure you will. I think we will. We've got I, to I, do some gigs first. And what's the, any plans for that? I know that's like juggling cats, even getting that together, but any yeah, plans? Next Next year, yeah, next year, uh, especially as those three are um, uh, living in uh, Holland, the Netherlands, uh, then possibly we'll do some gigs there to start. Maybe, maybe some gigs in Europe in the summer next year. Now, working with Super Tramp as opposed to working with these guys, it must be it's a different time. You're a different guy, more or less, a little bit. Um, well, th th that must be really different. Yeah, Supertramp was 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 always there was the the songwriters that there as the sort of basis of, of everything. But then the five of us were really just kind of equal partners working everything out, and we rehearsed quite a, a long time, went over the tunes again, and, and in the studio it was uh, it was just a everybody did and contributed the best that they could what they. What they could do, you know. Um, it was just a, a five minds get, getting on it and working it all out. This one with the Dutch guys is slightly different because it was kind of that it's kind of that it was my and the bass players. We're going to share the, the credits on it. So it was all all the arrangements were worked out um, just by sending each other emails and uh, and suggesting a key for a number or whatever and we just worked that out remotely so we didn't we had uh, we had music kind of chords written out but uh, we didn't all get together and we didn't play it at all until the, the four of us met there was a really good empathy between us yeah uh, I, I don't and i didn't dominate and i don't want to dominate i think it it was a real group effort because on some of the tracks they don't even play anyway. Um, there's a there's a duo between the keyboards and the drums, and there's a solo bass, and uh, like to give everyone their their space, which yeah. I think is that's how it should be. Yeah, you started laughing. Was that going to be on Crisis? You did that. What album was that going to be on? It was always been around, and we'd done it uh, live. It's on. I think it's on Paris, isn't it? It is on Paris. Yeah. And then we thought, think at one stage we just did the beginning of it before a concert. We didn't go into the verse. Uh, I just thought it'd be a nice vehicle for um, for the uh, for that for that group. Yeah, and and the drums the drums come in yeah. into play there. Really nice. 
uh, from this place, the Pat Metheny song, which we referenced a while ago, the, when, when I was listening, I remembered that I'm going, do I, I know this song. And, and I, cause I listened to it on Spotify. So I'd had to, uh, by memory, try to think, okay, what is this song? Cause it's kind of a fun thing to do. Right. Yeah. Then I went back to the original Metheny and I'm going, you managed to ca capture, and that was a vocal on there, was great vocalist, and he's famous for, I know Nando Loria, who is one of his vocalists. Um, yeah. And, but you managed to get, there was that, that there's a sort of sacred feel. Just, I, I'm not religious, but I almost say religious. There's just something wonderful yeah. about that song. Your version is amazing. Well, that yes, it, it, it's it's reasonably simple, and I don't take the the melody all the time. The, the piano begins with the mel melody, and then I come in, and and in fact, I think we just play the tune. That's that's it, and then there's a little blow at the end. It's it's not as long as the Pat Metheny version, but when I got that um, uh, uh, Pat Metheny album and then put it on, it's it's not the first track. It comes in about about three quarters of an hour after, and then I'm, I'm just sitting in the chair and thinking, oh my goodness, this, wow. And I just put it on repeat, <laughs> repeat. I thought, this is a great tune. And so that just came straight into my mind. Uh, it was as I was thinking about this album, and I thought, oh, we're gonna, gonna try that. Yeah. You know, when I was playing New Age music, uh, after Roger left the band, I, I got into uh, that New Age wave format that they had in L.A. I, I was the first person in the country to do multi. And there's a reason I'm mentioning this. I started playing Pat Metheny. And I remember playing the duo album from Pat Metheny and Lyle Mays, As Falls Wichita, So Falls Wichita Falls. And on yeah. that album is their version of Amazing Grace, Estupanda Grasa. And I remember putting that on and it's like the phones went insane like i have never i've been in rock radio pop radio at that point uh now i was doing new age music and i've never the phones rang for hours by playing his version of amazing grace and i remember going and i'd heard about him you know i knew who he was but there was just and there's lots of good tracks on that album as well i remember thinking okay something's going on here you know just yeah. it's that kind of and your it's version amazing. of that song of, of of well of the Matheny song from this place it 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 gave me goosebumps so I got to tell you that oh that's nice thank you yeah Three I'm gonna go back I'm gonna go back and listen after this I'm gonna listen to the Amazing Grace yeah it's pretty good. yeah the yeah, whole album that, is great do you happen to know what what it means as falls Wichita what the, why do they say I'm, those numbers in there they they read out numbers. I don't, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. Oh, it could have been uh, uh, latitude, longitude. I don't know what it was. I don't know why they do. Someone had told me once when I played it. But now you've mentioned um, new uh, age crossover stuff. There's, there's so many saxophone, saxophone twiddlers. Just they just twiddle and twiddle endlessly and it just doesn't really go anywhere or mean anything to me like a singer doing runs to me yeah. it, it's like it's, I, yeah. I find it grates on my nerves a little bit yeah 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 so it's just a question of taste isn't it in the end i guess but interestingly enough uh, occasionally i'll meet someone and they and they say uh, what do you do uh, i'll play the saxophone Oh, do you, do you play do you play jazz? I said, yeah, yeah, maybe I play jazz a bit. She's, and they say, oh, I like jazz saxophonists. I like Kenny G. That's what they say. <laughs> and I, I always say, yeah, good for you. That's good. That's good. Yeah, but that's that's all they know. These some of these people. Good. Ah, Free the jazz, lady jazz, butterfly. Yeah, one of Jasper's uh, tunes. He writes interesting tunes. There's. Uh, there's there's another one that we couldn't we couldn't do either. Um, just interesting tunes. I don't know where where they come from, but a real um, sense of you know, hence the name. Real sense of flight, sense of happiness, joyfulness, yeah. freedom. You know, in that song. Well, uh, he probably he, he he put them forward for consideration for the album, and um, I like the tunes. He probably writes a lot more which I haven't heard, and it, but he, he probably suggested them to me because he, maybe he thought thought that they would suit my style or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 
Good tune. Oh, Hop Jazz. Is that one's yours, right? Hop Sax. Hop Sax. I'm reading it off Spotify here and I can't see. Not wearing my glasses. Yeah. Uh, now, hey, you, you let your hair down. Yeah. It's interesting. The, the genesis of, of that tune is that um, I was um, uh, on the board of trustees of the Manchester Jazz Festival. And about five years ago, we had a new partner that sold beer at the festival. And it was, it was uh, Thwaites Breweries in Blackburn, Lancashire. And um, we decided that um, I would write a tune um, about for, for the jazz festival, a, a theme and the, and the beer company. Uh, prior to that, they they got me to go to the to the brewery and, and create my own beer. So I created a beer for, that was only going to be sold at the festival. And then I wrote it. The, the tune came after. Um, so we called it, we called the beer Hop Sax as a play on words, sax and hops. And, so Hop Sax. And then, then I wrote a tune that would that would I called it that it was just just came out of my practicing by myself one day so so that's the uh, that's where it, it's sort of from it's 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 sacks of hops <laughs> but it's also hop sacks so what did the beer taste like really nice a little bit a little bit like um another beer that uh, quite quite hoppy and 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 sharp and uh not too strong there was various constraints that it had to had to be for a festival but, but with the taste that, that i like there's a there's a very uh, good beer over here by a different company called timothy taylor's landlord and that beer is is one of the best beers you can buy so it was a little little towards that taste hop sacks oh my god that's so cool you, you, and you can you can you still get hop sacks no, no, it was only brewed, yeah. only brewed sort of one time for the festival. Micro, um, sort of micro brewery part of Thwaites beers. Good beer though. Good. Um, yeah, that was nice. So if asked, if asked, would you circle back and do that again? Yeah, I would like to do that again. I, I enjoyed, I've never been, uh, well, I had been in a brewery before, but it was, it was a totally new thing to me, but it was nice to be able to, my opinion as to how things should taste. Appleton Avenue. Well, I have a friend who is a band leader, as a trumpeter, and uh, uh, he writes he writes lots of uh, tunes, and it's it's a tune that I'd heard him play uh, with his with his band, uh, and I thought it, just because it's a beautiful tune, uh, I, so I thought we'd just play it. Appleton Avenue. Presumably, it's it's. A place somewhere i've never asked him but he said when i sent him the, what, what we did and finished and, and I, I sent it over to him he said he cried so it was very well it wasn't that bad it was that good <laughs> yeah joni mitchell you, you, a blue joni mitchell i remember the first time when you cry in spite of yourself you're a guy and you listen to joni mitchell blue and you listen to river which is now <laughs> a christmas song but I remember that reaction, you know, when a guy cries. Yes, that's a lot. I, I rarely cry at stuff. I cry at um, uh, uh, cinema, the music for Cinema Paradiso. Yeah, beautiful piece of music. Yeah, uh, and that just brings up, I feel something in my throat thinking, oh no, I'm going to cry again. That's a, that's a great, great film, great music. Oricone. The mission, Ennio Morricone, that that made me cry. The mission, yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a beautiful tune. Yeah, hey, you could do that. Wait a minute, next album, Is it, isn't it called Gabriel's? Some yeah, 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 that one there. Yeah, we and we played that on New Age Radio. So oh, okay. and there's a song by Mark Mark Isham name uh, it makes my wife cry. Uh, my wife was Champagne Shoulders from an album called Castalia. Every time that comes on, if I put it on now, she'd come downstairs. She'd come downstairs like right away. There's just certain songs 
they get you, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Lassie, lie near me. I, I remember hearing June Tabor do that. Uh, uh, that is a yes. beautiful. Oh my God. Beautiful. Well, there's a group. There's a group called Quercus. Now, Quercus is the name of a type of oak, wood oak, but Quercus, and it's uh, June Tabor sings with them. Yeah. And Ian Bellamy on saxophone. And uh, they have some really good albums. Uh, and so I've, I like quite a few of their, their numbers. In fact, there might be another one. Maybe Then I'll Be a Rose. That's another one that I heard by June Tabor. Yeah, she's got a lovely voice. Very, very deep for a, a woman. Uh, contralto voice. Yeah, just love, just good tunes. The lads in there, in their hundreds from the from the other album from the the lads in their hundreds yeah that's that's another beautiful tune that i heard her sing that's on that's on this album mm -hmm. darren darren emails me a lot what was the feeling like when breakfast in america won two grammy awards for best album package and best engineering non-classical recording it was good. We, we 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 thought we might get album of the year or something, but we got picked. I think that was when the Doobie Brothers. I think it might have been the Doobie Brothers that beat us there. But very very pleased. Yeah, we, we we're very happy about that. Um, yeah, best engineer and what was it? Best engineer and then best album. Best album package. Yeah, package. and best engineered non classical recording. Well, we're very proud of the. Um, working with the, um, the designer and the photographer to do that and creating Libby, the Statue of Liberty, you know. Um, she just died a couple of, two or three years ago, the actress, the, the lady that played Libby, Kate. And oh, I didn't know she was dead. I didn't know she had died. Yeah, she went to a, an old person's uh, movie, movie person's home. Yeah, there's a great picture of us sitting in there with holding the album cover. Did she ever appear on stage anywhere with you? Yeah, yeah, she served us some um, orange juice at, at, uh, in, in Los Angeles, at least. It was really good. Were you guys ready for that? Like that's, um, when I talk to bands, I, I like I was talking to Pete, Pete Agnew uh, and they just lost uh, uh, their singer, um, Dan McCafferty. But I said, were you ready for Hair of the Dog? Were you for, ready for the, you know, because all of a sudden you're there and you're doing really well. You're eating, the family's okay. But then you get Hair of the Dog and you're big in America. Um, and the Greatest well, Hits package did that too. Yes, we were ready because uh, it, it all happened while we were touring for nine months. And so we were, we were just doing our gigs anyway. The audiences were, were really good. You know, but we were away from other types of adulation, I guess. But uh, the gigs were going really well um, all through. This is all through 1979. And then we heard that the album was number one, and but we're still working and touring. So it, it was good for us. And none of us were particularly young. We weren't teenagers making it, so it didn't go straight to our heads. So we were able to keep quite a level uh keep get keep it on the level yeah. did, did anybody in the band splurge um you don't seem like the splurging type of band to me but no did anybody buy a really. porsche anybody buy a porsche <laughs> not until more recently for me <laughs> no what did we do what, uh, we... did you buy a porsche no i bought i bought um, a diesel mercedes but there was a there was a gas crisis, so we had an extra tank put in the the trunk of, of it, so we could go something like one thousand two hundred miles before we had to fill up. Did you get that put in? Yeah. Well, I didn't know you can do that, but of course you can do that. Yes, yeah, just an extra uh, uh, you, the petrol the the diesel tank, and then you just kind of duplicate it. So. Wow. That's really silly. By the way, you mentioned Manchester a while ago. You don't live in Manchester, do you? 
live in near the um, near the uh, 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 the Lake District, which is about 70, 80 miles north of Manchester. My in-laws, uh, I married into an English family the first time around. Luckily, she's very good friends with my current wife. Uh, we all get along, but they were from Manchester. My my mother-in-law used to say, good good working class town. She'd always tell me in her thick English accent, you know, and all the relatives are there. So there you go. Well, that's, I'm, I'm from the, the north, from a, a working class town. And uh, I, can't, I live in the countryside now, uh, just on an ex, what used to be a farm. But uh, it's nice to be able to look out and see sheep and cows, it's good. And we can get to the Lake District within five minutes, five or 10 minutes, wow. the edge, and the Yorkshire Dales, uh, it's, it's, a good, it's a good area. How did your parents react, or, or did they get a chance to react to your success? Did, did they see it? Yeah, it's funny. Um, they're not really interested in pop music at, at all, and, and I sort of struck out, and. And they were they were worried. They wanted me to keep my job as a computer programmer, but they didn't interfere so much. And then they occasionally, very occasionally, come to gigs. And they they came down to London, and I think it was Wembley we were playing. Big gig, you know, good gig. Not Wembley, uh, Wembley Arena, not not the stadium, <clears throat> but it was good. And my mom and dad came. And the manager of the group at the time, he collared my dad after the, the show. He said, what do you think then, Cliff, Mr. Halliwell, what do you think? And the dad said, mm, yeah, yeah, quite good. I, I, I shan't want to see him again. <laughs> Something like that. He wouldn't, he said? Now, how old would he be? This is 79. This is in 79. So uh, he'd be 68. So you were saying he would or wouldn't want to see you again? He wouldn't, no. Oh, said, that's what... I don't need to see him again. <laughs> but and it's... then the next time they did come again, and my mom, and the chief excitement of the trip for my mom was seeing uh, one of the famous Australian tennis... Who's the most famous Australian tennis player? From way back, Rod Laver. Yeah, my mom. The, my mom came to uh, uh, Earl's Court where we played, uh, but the highlight of the trip was seeing Rod Laver in, in the hotel lobby. That's it. And and my mom had a stroke, not not too serious, but she. And I don't know whether it actually happened during the concert or not, but uh, <laughs> she was never the same after that after that trip. Or did they they did they get it, it's 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 a question I ask everyone. I'm actually making a compilation of everything. And you know, John, as you can imagine, half the parents get it because of that. That was a generation gap back then. That was really yeah, a generation no, gap. I would say that my parents didn't get it, what, what we were doing. They were they were they were musical, but as I said before, uh, when I spoke about Christmas, they uh, they were into um, Handel, Messiah and church music or whatever. Okay, if you, you got a call tomorrow and you know so much more than I do and you know what I'm going to say, you got a call tomorrow. We're getting the old band back together. Oh my God, Roger and, and, and Rick are talking. I don't know how it happened, but I know it's happening. And everyone's a game. What if they say, let's do a one-off show, a nice goodbye thing. Would you do it? And would you want that to happen? Yes, yes. Very happy. I love playing. So if if it could be possible that they that they could all get back together, the the, the famous five sort of thing, uh, absolutely, I'd be right there. Love it. And uh, you think it's ever going to happen? No. <laughs> that was a really quick quick answer. I don't think so. Right in there. <laughs> yeah, I. Uh... I think, you know, there's that thing between they go, oh, oh, the fans want it. Because I was talking to Dennis DeYoung and he said, well, you know, the fans want me back in the band. And I agree. The fans want him back in sticks. But it, it goes back to that oldest argument that I've ever had, which is, do you want to go on a road trip with your ex-wife? And sometimes it feels that way. And even if it's a one-off show, I mean, you've probably heard what's happening with Journey. Now they're fighting with each other. They're threatening to sue each other. It's just insane. 
I don't think it will. There's there's quite a, a a chasm between how Rick and Roger think, the, the two of them. Plus, there's the fact that in 2015, Rick contracted multiple myeloma, and a tour was cancelled, and uh, he's he, he's on the he's recovered, but he's. I don't think he's strong enough to do a, a stadium tour. He might be strong enough to do uh, a one-off gig or a few gigs, but I think there's there's too much of a chasm between the two, the two songwriters. But it, you never know. But we're not getting any younger. So there you go. Well, I know Rick had good. Obviously, he had good treatment uh, up in in New York. Uh, he lives on Long Island. And uh, so I think he had the best treatment that he could. And um, he's, he said the other day in an interview, I've just read an interview he, he did in the summer. And he said he's doing ke chemotherapy on a regular basis. So I don't know exactly what that involves. I just heard him say that. He, he's never said that to me personally. You, uh, you ended with the upbeat, cool song. It's just a little... A blues tune that uh, I was just practicing um, playing the clarinet one day and I worked out a little blues tune and the, the uh, blue is central is an anagram of clarinet blues simple anagram so I do crosswords so it, it just fell it fell into place there you know, Arise is the, the biggest one on Spotify. It's uh, it's done really, really well. Tell me about that one. Well, now, Jasper, the bass player, he is the bass player for oh, Lynn Ariel. Yeah. yeah. Lynn, so he, he's, he told me he was a bass player with Lynn Ariel. So I already had a couple of CDs of Lynn Ariel. And so I listened to them and, and uh, I heard her play this number. And so I, I emailed or called Jasper and said, hey, your colleague that you work with when she's in Europe has written this lovely tune. Uh, he said, oh yeah, we play it. We play it all the time. We play it at our concerts. And uh, I said, well, maybe we could do a version of it. He said, I'll ask her. Not that you have to, but it's, it's nice to, to ask. So he did, and she, and she must have said yes. And, um, and so we, we, we tried that tune. So there is a personal connection on his side for that. And um, I've, got a, I've actually got a good reaction from Lynn herself. Because I, I wrote to her after we'd done this recording, I'd heard a recording of her playing one of my favorite, favorite tunes, which is the Ballad of the Sad Young Men. And he, she was playing with a, a, another a friend of mine, a colleague, a, well, someone I've worked with, Randy Brecker on trumpet. I've worked with him in Europe and a uh, nice guy. But the two of them are playing together on this, uh, on this uh, Ballad of the Sad Young Men. And so I wrote to Lynn Ariel, I got a, I got her email from Jasper and wrote to her and said how much I enjoyed the number. And she wrote back to me and said, oh, thanks. That's nice of you. And by the way, you do a really good job on, on my, my song, Arise. So we, 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 it's nice to have the, uh, the composer. Alan Parsons had told me that, uh, and I was surprised because I like John Miles. Uh, I miss John Miles. Uh, but... I didn't know he'd say John Miles. He says the most musical person he ever talked to, he ever played with, was John Miles. What about you? I've had the pleasure of, of playing with, not in his uh, solo group, but the, the guitarist Mike Stern, who's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite musicians. And so I've shared the stage with him. I played with Randy Brecker and Mike Stern in a, in a band that's led by a Hungarian who lives in Germany, Leslie Mandoki. I've interviewed him. Yeah, and he gets these, he calls it his soulmates, and he gets pop people and jazz people. So I've had the, I've shared the stage with, with those two guys, and 
various others, Alda Miola on, um, on guitar. I don't know I think, why more people don't know Leslie Mandoki. I don't know. I, I, I find it I, I, going, he's such a musical guy, gets mm. all these people together. And I'm always surprised because eccentric type of guy to talk to, but he was, he was interesting. He is. He get, and he gets things done. He, he, he manages to get people. If he wants to work with someone, he, he, he manages to, to get them somehow. It's good. It's good though. And uh, it's been cut back a bit with the COVID, but uh, I'm going to be playing with him and probably with Mike Stern and Randy Brecker and others. The saxophonist Bill Evans um, and the, the German trumpet player Kilbronner and, and various others. Uh, I think sometime August, September next year. Yeah, so that, that'll be good. What's your take on at your age when you smile a lot when you talk about the people you're going to be working with and things coming up? Don't you find this keeps you young? Absolutely. There's no, there aren't any age barriers with playing music. Yeah, you're not a football player. <laughs> no, because they're, they're, they're done by age 37 or something. Oh, let me, been watching a lot of football recently, by the way. But there's, there's it, what was interesting, that there's back about 15, 16 years ago, I'm, I formed a group, made a CD, Creme Anglaise, and in that band, there was, there was somebody born in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. There was five decades of births going, in, going into that band. Amazing. Creativity so it, is something that, that uh, uh, creativity has a special energy, I think. Yeah, it, it didn't matter the age. I mean, obviously, you can't go too young because you, you need... With musicians, you need a little bit of time to, to get going, but the really good ones blossom quite early, you know. Uh, what about the super the other super tramp project you were talking about? We've got the um, we've I created well the genesis of that is in 2013 or 14, a friend of mine who teaches or taught jazz at the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. He, he said, John, I've got an idea. I've got the student jazz band that I'm, that I'm leading and teaching the kids. Uh, he said, why don't we do a, a concert of Supertramp tunes? And I'll get, I'll, I'll arrange a couple. We'll, we'll get some, some of the guys, get different people to arrange the tunes. So I said, yeah, that sounds good, Mike. So Mike Hall. So we did a concert way back then and, it, and the idea started there and then one of the saxophone players rob buckland who is a band leader now uh, he said john let's let's do this project let's get pro musicians and let's let's do it so it took a long time <laughs> just before the covid we got it all together we got the musicians and we did a few gigs and it sounded really 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 good and fun to do so instrumental versions of, of all only super tramp tunes, no vocals. And then COVID hit, bang, and we were we were due to record, and that was put back for a couple of years. Anyway, last summer we we managed to finish the recordings, but we're waiting now for permission, which hasn't been granted, to to put the the, the tunes out from Rick Davis and Roger Hodgson. The, the publishers have said no. So take take that as you uh, as you hear it. Isn't it weird? But what what's 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 the yeah. harm? Like you're not you're not you're not in an in a negative relationship with these guys, right? No. Not musically at all. No. No, it's 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 weird. So uh, at the moment, it's it's not out, but it's there. And it's, it's just ready. sitting there. It's it's ready. It's sitting there. Yeah. Oh, this will get them talking. <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. It's well, interesting. that's a shame. That's uh, I'm, And, you know, Don Henley, I was telling this to someone yesterday. When he, Don Henley released Inside Job, he's standing in front of an A&E audience for an A&E TV special. He looks at all of them, he takes a breath and he says, none of you know, and it's okay, how much blood, sweat and tears and parts 
that go into making one of these records. Yeah. How much it takes to make one of these. Oh, play that, play the bass again. Do that. You know, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm overstating the obvious. And you have it right there. It's all ready. Yeah, it's there. What songs did you play? What songs were on there? Can you tell you, us that? Name some songs. I'll tell, tell you if we have a version of it. Well, um, you could start with um, the, the album uh, Crime of the Century. We, we have a version of Crime of the Century. We have a version of Dreamer. Here are your top 10 Super Tramp songs according to Spotify. Oh, yeah. I, Let's see if we do any of them. I think you had seen the thing I did. I think you had said last time we talked, you had seen I, I did a thing on the top 10 songs or whatever. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. that's right. The number one was uh, number one song for 302 million streams is Give a Little Bit. Number two, right. Logical Song for 281 yeah. streams. We do that. Okay. Breakfast in America, number three with 206 streams. And we do that. Goodbye Stranger, number four, 119. We have a version, but we haven't, we haven't recorded it, but we have it for live. So do the same, does the same publishing company, I mean, since it's a Roger Hodgson, and Rick Davies, they handle both sides, right? Yeah, a, the company's called Delicate. Okay. Uh, number five is Take the Long Way Home with 91 million streams. Yeah. Uh, I was I was kind of surprised, but not surprised because uh, it's raining. It's raining again. Comes ahead of anything from uh, Crime of the Century. That's forty nine thousand streams. Yeah, we do that. School is number seven. I was surprised. Seventy two million. We don't do school. Dreamer at forty five million. We do Dreamer. Yeah. A uh, number nine, Bloody Well Right, thirty four yeah. million. We do that. That's a good one. And here's one, Lord Is It Mine, at 14 million streams. Yeah, we, we, we have a version of that, but we haven't recorded it. We also have two um, compilations. Uh, one from Famous Last Words, a compilation of about three or four tunes. And another one which, rather cleverly, uh, the, the arranger is called Brunch. So it's a combination of breakfast in America and lunch or whatever. And that's got that's got some things from um, Crisis, What Crisis, Ain't Nobody But Me and other things like that. We, we do lots and it's really good fun. This is, so, this, this, this bothers me. Yeah. Well, it bothers me. What can you do now? Wait. But with publishing stuff, you just don't get on the phone. Hey, Rick. Hi, Roger. It doesn't work that way, right? You got to go through the publisher sort of thing. Yeah, you got to go through the publishers and they and they refused. So you wait to see if something, what you ask again? I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know the. I guess so. Yeah. Oh, man. Because I so want, last time you told me this, I was so excited. You know, and other people heard you say it. And they were very excited about it because why not? By the way, are there any, uh, someone asked, Andrea Grasso asked, are there unreleased archival things? I guess that's between Roger and Rick that the, uh, or have you heard that might be released? I don't know. I don't think so. We, all along through the, the, the times of success, et cetera, we, we never had a, a big backlog of, of recordings. There was a backlog of songs, but they weren't, they weren't put down, weren't committed to tape. So I know that Roger was very prolific and maybe maybe still is. So he's, he's, he's probably got loads and loads of tunes that songs that are not out. But as far as I know, there's never, some things come up from maybe like a BBC session that we would have done in the seventies or and I hear those occasionally on, on YouTube or wherever but th there's not um, any new stuff as far as i know how was it told to you that even though there's two lead singers you were kind of going to be the master of ceremonies how oh, was that it, it, it was it was just chance really because we started to do some concerts and when after i joined the concerts were really quite serious because we were presenting crime of the century to the public and it was a black stay black stage and we did side one we just performed side one without any speaking i think and then we did a few other numbers which subsequently were to appear on 
crisis. And then we did side two to finish that. Side two of Prime of the Century to finish. So it was, um, it was quite interesting, but a bit serious. So it seemed like we had to say something to the audience after they heard four numbers or whatever it was, and but nobody else wanted to do it. So I just said, well, oh, well, I'll do it then. I'll, I'll talk to them. You were good. You were so good at that. Well, I think it's a, it's a question of, of, of not really thinking too much about it, you know, and just talking to them as though it, I'm talking to you, you know, just not making a big deal out of it, but just saying, hey, how are you doing? That's good. Well, it was nice notoriety for you too. So like when you, you know, the, the man who's, who played all those instruments to be able to go up in front and it made it, it made a good balance. I don't know why it's like a yeah. separation. No, it was good. It was good because it, it, it lightened when we're doing serious stuff, it lightens the load and, and, uh, uh, and it was just nice and relaxing uh, for, for us and the audience. Uh, yeah. So now, interestingly enough, the last thing that the King of England said to me when he was Prince Charles in 1986, we did a Royal Variety performance. Uh, no, we did a Prince's Trust performance at the Royal Albert Hall. And um, Prince Charles and Princess Diana came to the gig and we met them. You know, we were in a line and all this and we met them. And, and I, first of all, I met her and, and then Charles came along and he sort of said something like, and what do you do? You know, that, that sort of thing. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I play saxophone and keyboards, do background singing, and, um, and I do the announcements. And he said, ah, I said, good. Well, I hope you're going to be funny. <laughs> and went along to the next one, next person. So that's the last thing that the king said to me. Wow, so you met Princess Di, huh? Yeah. She yeah. said she was a bit nervous, interestingly enough. Because she asked me how I was or something, and I, I said, yeah, I'm a little nervous meeting you. And she said, I'm, I'm nervous too, you know, tonight for some reason. She was a big Soup Trump fan, apparently, Princess Diane. We were one of her favorite groups. So this is before the show, right? This is. This was before the show, yeah. This is in 86. What was the high point for you? I mean, right now it seems like you're in your element and you're being able to press the buttons when you want to and do what you want and plan. And there's, I, I kind of, there's, there's a bit of me looking at you of going, oh, he's, he's in tune with his inner child, which is what keeps you living and living. And but yeah, well, I'm, I'm enjoying playing, and I don't think that my, uh, my playing has has reached the apex yet. I think maybe at some stage it may. And this can be mental or physical with playing an instrument. You know, I might kind of lose the muscles or something for playing. And I hope that I shall have the uh, uh, wherewithal, mental strength to say to myself, right, you're going downhill now, stop, you know. But I still think that I'm going up. I still it's a good place. It's a good, it's, a good it's a good place to be. It's a great yeah. place to be. My playing is getting better, so I'm enjoying playing. I could do with playing a bit more re recently, but it, I'm in a good a good space. But I've always enjoyed just playing and improvising with people. Um, uh, uh, so I don't know about a big a high point. I mean, we play to big crowds, but it's quite nice playing to smaller crowds, you know. Um, what about Super Tramp? What were the high? What was that? Is there a, a moment where maybe you were on stage and you went? Because some artists say, "Well, no, I was too busy doing it. I didn't know at the time." I, you know, where I say, "Well, you were on the Ed Sullivan show. Did did you like Car Carmine a piece?" I'm talking to him and say, "You're in the Ed Sullivan show, Vanilla Fudge. Did did you really feel?" He's, "Oh God, I knew this was a moment. If we never did anything again, I knew this." Were there moments, defining moments like that for you? I think it's nice. Yeah. Well, gigs. Gigs are the, the main thing. I really enjoy playing live. And just what springs to mind is uh, what I would just be talking about meeting Prince Charles and Princess Diana. But that was at the Royal Albert Hall. And that's a that's a really nice place to be able to go out and do a concert in. Because it from the stage, it, it looks so nice with all the boxes and 
and everything. And it, so it's a really good gig to be able to do. It's not it's not too big that you can't you can't see the people at the back, you know. But it's it's big enough to have a good audience, uh, and obviously if they're enthusiastic. So I would think that playing at the Albert Hall is one of the we did it several times. The highlight they've become the highlights of 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 our career from the seventies eighties. Well, taking out the fact that, of course, Rick had MM, what was your feeling when you knew, at the time when you found out that Rick couldn't do it, was the, was the announcement that this is going to be it or we'll see how it goes? Well, he didn't know. Uh, uh, and, it was, and it was put across as being very serious, which what it is. So we didn't even know, the rest of us didn't even know, oh, crikey, is he going to survive this or, or what? You know, so it was just... Uh, relief once we found out that he was he was doing okay. Uh, disappointment at the time because we we had the tour booked uh, and um, seats had already been sold or places, uh, so that was disappointing just on a, a selfish basis because it is nice to go out and, and play to people. You know that's that's where we're at. And one last one for when, when Roger left, I know there was a lot of tension there. And I mean, the fans were really sad that Roger left, but I think it was you that told me on some level, we were kind of relieved so we could just get on with it. He could do his own thing and, and, and we could do our own thing. Cause brother, where you bound, as you mentioned before, as a, one of the top, I love that album a lot. The other two, not as much, but no, but, but that album. Serious. Yeah. It's yeah. a serious statement. And that's what it, uh, once Roger was always um, it was always trying to leave when we were when we were rehearsing for, for the tunes for before recording uh, uh, Rhyme of Century. We kind of it, it was off to India. It was going to India. We had to kind of pull him. Pull him back. You're not going. Don't go to India. Let's make this album. Let's let's make it's going to be good. Okay, yeah, he wanted to go off with Ken, became the lighting guy, uh, to India. So actually we had to physically restrain him, well, mentally restrain him. Uh, so he was always wanting to go off, and then he did, uh, to, so he could be more productive himself, because he was writing a lot of songs. But then we decided to carry on, and there's the four of us, and we we thought to ourselves, well, Rick, uh, he we sort of decided to keep it in Rick style, and it just turned out to be serious. It was a serious style, a bit heavier. So we, we tried to make our mark that way. Well, Cannonball was a great le single to sort of say, yeah, we're still here. The video was amazing. I don't know how much money that cost, but that was crazy. Yeah, it was an interesting, interesting one. Part of it was done at the Santa Barbara Bowl. Um, yeah, I remember, I remember filming there. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was good, good time and, and a serious time. And we, I think we made our mark. Obviously, it wasn't as popular as as Miss in America, but we were forging ahead. But it stands out as a, a, a true, strong to me, uh, Super Tramp album. It really did. Yeah. yeah. What did you think of Rogers' first album? I'm almost done here, but what do you think of Rogers' In the Eye of the Storm? Did you listen to it? Were you be able to be objective because you were so close to? Well, I listened to it, and, and so there was one or two of the tunes that we'd already played around, you know, around with with Supertramp. And um, interestingly enough, he asked me if I would play on it, and I said no. I, I said I don't think I should because you want to just get a, a bit away from Supertramp. You want to be Roger Hodgson. I know you're a big part of Supertramp. But uh, if you have me on it as well, then it's going to sound a bit too much like Supertramp, probably. So he heeded. Well, he did. He had to heed what my uh, what I said because I didn't go and play play on it. But um, I thought that was a good idea, really. But I like his yeah. tunes. Yeah, he's a good tunesmith, and he's a he's a great uh, vocalist, a great harm harmonian. What do you call it? Some you. Harmonizing, Harmon, uh, harmonies, yeah, harmonizing, yeah. yeah. I just, by the way, do you talk to any of the guys from uh, Supertramp? Yeah, 
Yeah, I speak quite a bit with um, with Bob and Dougie even. Um, yeah, Dougie's, uh, Dougie has a, a place that was destroyed in Tortola with uh, storms and wind and rain and uh, hurricanes or whatever it was, and he's, he's recently rebuilt it. There was a story a few a few years ago that said he was dying. Story that said he was dying. They quoted a, a son, I think, of going. I'm going to have to go back home and look after my dad. He did. He did. He had a son who, who was studying. Uh, I think at St Andrews in Scotland, and he went back. Yeah, he, Dougie got ill, uh, but he's he's better. He's better now. I've, I've actually forgotten what he had. But, okay. Uh, he had, he had something quite serious. It was, it was about two or three years ago. Ben, with, with, with his type of drumming, which intrigued my son, because my son was a little prodigy when he was young, and now he's just oh, getting back yeah. into it. There was just, like, I, I just saw blues and jazz, and there was just so much in his drumming. And, and every time he'd do something, I'd always say, because I taught my son, then he, a month later, he says, can I have a real teacher, Dad? Um, but I would say I would never have done that, but, but I would have been wrong. Look what he did. He was just a very different drum, inventive. Yeah, very, 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 very solid and dependable and a, a great beat, his, his beat, not, not pushing, but not holding back. The drummer with um, B.J. Wilson was one of his heroes, the guy who used to drum with uh, Broco Harum. Uh, he was influenced by him. But Bob started off playing like surf music in, in California. But he was attracted by the British sounds and came over to live in London in the early 70s. So, yeah, great, great, great drummer. Yeah, his favorites. Yeah, same here. Same here. I really hope you enjoyed that. John is probably one of the nicest guys I've ever interviewed. It happens an awful lot. When you have a good conversation with someone, you never forget that. Don't Ever Leave Me is the brand new album from John Helliwell. There'll be links in the description where you can pick it up. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel. Share our videos, like them, we'd appreciate that. I'm John Bogan, this is Rock History Book.